that you can. Okay. Okay, perfect. So, uh, this, I got it. Can everyone hear Julia well? Hear me? Yeah, no, it, it sounds fine. Okay, perfect. So, uh, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this uh, presentation. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Julia. I am a PhD student in physics education research. And I'm at the very beginning of my second year of PhD here in Uppsala. Uh, my PhD project uh, turns around large language model in physics education. And in particular, for this paper that I'm about to present to you today, I used uh, ChatGPT version 4, so the last uh, model of the GPT series. Okay, so the paper that I'm talking about is the paper that I wrote together with Bohr. And um, precisely yesterday, we received the news that it has been accepted. So <laughs> today, I'm more than happy to present you uh, this work. So the title is How Understanding Large Language Model Can Inform the Use of ChatGPT in Physics Education. And the idea is that uh, if we aim to integrate it uh, in uh, physics education, we have at least to develop a basic understanding of how large language model work so that we are uh, aware of its way of functioning and we know what we can expect from it, uh, its limit, and how we could improve results and so on. Uh, and so that's what we try to do, we first uh, provide a basic understanding of how large language model and chat GPT work by looking at uh, uh, some technical knowledge from the domain of artificial intelligence and unpack it uh, and provide it to our uh, physics education community. Then we analyze the limitation and challenges in using chat GPT in a physics context we try to improve the performance of ChatGPT through prompt engineering techniques. That's why we stay here. And finally, we introduce a discussion about what kind of role ChatGPT can play in physics teaching and learning uh, process. Yes, thank you. Okay, so let's start uh, with our large language model work. So GPT was born in the far 2018, together with other large language models, but today we are going to talk about the GPT series. But it is in 2019 that we start talking about large language model, precisely because of the large number of learning parameters that OpenAI start using to train this model. So for GPT-2, they used 1.5 billion learning parameter. And the, the, the year after for GPT-3, they used over 175 billion learning parameter. So a big improvement. Then in 2021, we got GPT-3, uh, which got other kind of improvement, not in the number of learning parameter, but for example, in the Wind of context of the prompt. And then one year ago, November 2022, Open AI released ChatGPT, which is not the same of GPT. I'm going to show you some differences. And finally, in 2023, we got GPT-4, last version. So Open AI haven't disclosed yet the exact number of learning parameter they use to train this model, but it's safe to say that they use way more than one trillion learning parameter. So which is basically the good side of the internet. Okay, so let's start briefly to unpack what the acronym GPT means. So G stands for generative and it refers to the ability to generate text as output based both on the training data set and also on the uh, user's prompt. P stands for pre-trained uh, this comes from the domain of 
uh, machine learning. So basically, a language model is a neural network that have been trained on data sets of unlabeled text. NT stands from transformer, which refer to the transformer architecture that have been used and that since 2018, it has made the pre-trained process much more efficient. Okay, so you can think about GPT as an autocomplete tool, basically like the one that you have in your mobile phone or in your emails, where you start writing some text and the, it suggests you some words according to some statistics. This is the basic principle. Of course, GPT is more complex. And I want to show you this uh, working principle with two examples of text generated in the GPT Playground, which is a developer application um, that give access to the GPT model and allow the user to modify some parameters. Julia, what is a GPT model? Is that the same as ChatGPT? No, I said it. I don't okay. <laughs> I'm going to explain the difference okay. between GPT and ChatGPT. Yeah, it's not precisely the same. Uh, so we started writing this sentence. In physics, force is, and then we let uh, the model go on with the sentence. And what we got basically is exactly a sentence, which is composed by one word after another, according to the statistics that it has uh, found in the training data set. So for example, in this example, interaction is the most likely word to follow force. 82.65% of probability. And this makes sense because force in physics is a, a technical term, which is usually defined as an interaction between bodies. So it's likely to appear in this way. But for example, here, if we start saying in low force is, then we got power, which is the most likely word to follow, but it's not such a big probability like in the previous case. And the second most likely word is more or less the same mm -hmm. probability, which suggests that probably forcing law is not such uh, a thing. Okay, so this is basically what happened. So GPT put one word after another according to the statistic that it finds from this training data set. But as I said, uh, there are some parameters that can be modified and especially for the probability to have a certain output, there is an interesting part of parameter. So this is a picture of the GPT panel of parameters. And an interesting one is the temperature. The temperature is a number for between zero to two, and by default is set to one. And uh, it's used to control the randomness of the output. So if you set it higher, you have a uh, more random output. While if you set it lower, um, you have uh, basically that the values, uh, you have more more, uh, determini a more deterministic output. So it will be more likely that you have always the same sentence in the end. Okay, so to answer your question, <laughs> GPT is the large language model. Uh, or as sometimes it's called, is the bare-bone advanced autocomplete algorithm model. And it just includes the pre-trained architecture and the learning parameters. But it does not automatically allow for a uh, dialogue-like interaction, like answering question or following instructions. And so here we have chat GPT, uh, which uh, thanks to additional step we can use it, basically is a chatbot application empowered by uh, the GPT series. So it relies on, on uh, GPT's parameter and it is optimized for dialogue. Okay, so from what I've just said, I think it should be clear that chat GPT doesn't copy. It generates a test, a text which is, uh, which fits with your output, basically. Uh, it doesn't copy part of the words in ex the exact same way 
which is found in a particular uh, text or sometimes, I don't know. And if it's very similar to that, it means that it's very likely to find that sentence in that way in all the literature. So whatever it provides you is original. I understand, but like there are people who are going to be philosophers or other computer scientists who are going to be very picky about the way you're saying things, but I, I get the sentiment. Yeah. Okay, we can talk about that. Okay. So. Yeah, so it does not copy, but it answered this question rather. According to your model of statistics of human language, what words are likely to come next? <laughs> okay, does it <laughs> make sense? Sure. That's the perfect answer. Exactly. Okay. So we can move on, but I just would <laughs> like to drink a little bit to explore some limitations. I'm surprised you waited this long to drink the water. <laughs> okay, so from a side, it does not copy. From another side, we also have to be aware that ChatGPT does not understand, think, reason, lie, know, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is no intentionality in his actions. It has no perception of the meaning of what we are writing, what we are asking it to do. Um, but yeah, it's extremely hard not to anthropomorphize. Uh, I've seen this verb used in many, many papers in a very human-like way. But have you, as have you, you have seen, uh, the... The way in which it works is different from the way which a, a human brain works. And also, anthropomorph to anthropomorphize is dangerous for, first of all, because uh, ChatGPT contains bias, you know, and so bias can be propagated, especially with such a, um, such a tool that is very authoritative in the way it provides you the information. And also, uh, it is counterproductive uh, to anthropomorphize it. Because the point is that mm, we don't really know how to talk to an AI. I mean, we are used to our social interaction, which are uh, based on some social rules. But it doesn't mean that it could be the same uh, for the AI. We don't know what it needs. To understand what we want, understand what we want. Uh, so yes, uh, it's something that we should always remember when we approach, uh, especially for uh, when we try to prompt it. But I'll talk about it later. Uh, so let's see some uh, some problems, some categories of problems. Hallucination, so it makes factually incorrect statements, references, etc. I'm pretty sure you all already know about this, so I'm not going to say anything more. But I have a question. So uh, is it surprising that it makes up fact? I mean, it doesn't have any idea if what it's writing is real or not. Mm -hmm. So this is something, to me, not surprising. Uh, reasoning reasoning okay uh, so there are um, several researchers saying that ChatGPT fades in arithmetic reasoning logical reasoning common sense reasoning and of course this is problematic if we uh, want to use it for physics um, so to limit let's say these two categories of mistakes uh, OpenAI have recently um, introduced the plugins. I don't know if you know about plugins. Basically, uh, plugins are external models which uh, are tasked with operations that the large language model can't so address properly. But that's not the free version, right? You have to pay. Yes, yeah. this is for version four. Uh, I'm not sure I said it at the beginning. Uh, maybe yes, that for all my study, I've used version four. Oh, okay. Yes. You can't access that anymore now. No, if you want to subscribe now, you have to, you, you will be put in a list. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Just like a week ago. <laughs> the word got out. <laughs> <laughs> so we are privileged because we have this uh, ChatGPT4 in our division. Okay, so for example, uh, one plugin <laughs> to limit its mathematical problem is the one with Wolfram Alpha. Mm -hmm. 
But another one is the advanced data analysis mode, which is a plugin to a Python compiler. And also to, um, uh, to limit the problem of hallucinations in references, there is uh, this Scholar AI uh, plugin, which basically helps to find peer review papers. But the problem with plugins is that uh, it doesn't, ChatGPT doesn't uh, connect to them uh, automatically. You have to, to say to it which one you want to use. And at the moment, there are more than 1,000 plugins. So basically, you have to know precisely which one you need for your task, which is kind of a tricky, a tricky story. So though now they've integrated advanced data analysis into the, the mode. default mode. So it sometimes uses it on its own. Yes. Yes, the point is that everything is going very fast. So uh, even if uh, we finished this paper two months ago, we have already noticed that something has been updated. Uh, so it's going really, really fast. Uh, OK, then bias, we all know it has bias about gender, race, religion, culture, political view. And then also remember that most of the literature it has, it's in English. So it's very rooted in the West culture. Uh, and then reliability, which together with reasonings are problematic, especially in physics. Uh, if we wanna use ChatGPT to learn. And I'm now going to show you an example that show how uh, even version four, so the state of the art large language model still uh, fail uh, with a high uh, rate. It's very unstable in the rate of correctness. So uh, the problem is this one. Uh, if two bodies with different mass have the same kinetic energy, which one has the largest momentum? This is a conceptual problem, which means no mass is involved. You just have to look at the formula of kinetic energy of the momentum. Make no calcul I mean, no, no computation is involved. But yes, exactly. Mathematics is. Yes, some mathematics, but it's not a heavy mass problem, let's say. And so you compare the formula of kinetic energy and momentum, and you see that the object with the largest mass has the largest momentum. But so. In this problem, we got that four times over eight, it answered incorrectly. And among the correct answer, it presented an unsatisfactory explanation. So some incorrectness and uh, incomplete explanation. So really not very good if you want to use it uh, for learning. And so the next question that came to us is, how could we improve the performance of ChatGPT uh, in this kind of conceptual problems? Exactly. So I drink again, since this is a new section. <laughs> okay, so there might be several ways. The one that we approach in this in this paper uh, is related to how to learn, how to prompt better. And so we enter uh, in the domain of prompt engineering, which is, uh, uh, let's say, an empirical science. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a prompt is a natural language instruction given to the large language model to facilitate the generation of an output. And how we prompt uh, highly impact the output that we get. Um, and prompting is totally not trivial. First of all, because there are no fixed rules. And secondly, as I was kind of saying a little bit before, we don't precisely know what the uh, AI needs to understand what we want it to do. So, uh, which, mm -hmm. and, yes. I was just thinking, I mean, uh, because the image generating uh, AIs, they have rules. So there's, it's interesting that there is a difference because they have the, you know, where you can add things for like format and uh, these types of things, which we don't really have with like ChatGPT. With Prompt, yeah. 
but it's interesting that they, they have, there are AIs where you actually have these types of uh, structures and rules for the prompting as well. I mean, you, you, you can find some kind of structures that are very, not just for physics, yeah. but in general. Yeah. And actually, I'm going to show you uh, some examples that are helpful. But yeah, in general, we cannot say there, there, are, there is a list of yeah. rules that if you follow them, you will get mm -hmm. a good mm -hmm. result. Uh, and yeah, so I was saying that I read a very nice paper that says how people that have no knowledge of prompt engineering and large language model cannot basically formulate a good prompt because they use they they approach to the design of a prompt uh, in a way that resembles the interaction with a person, and this is not fruitful. So okay, I'm going to show some mm, very simple technique that can help. Uh, to improve the the results. Okay, uh, I start with this one, providing the context. I show you a part of this video, if it works. Oh, maybe I have to do it here. Okay, I'm not well, of it. Take a look again. What just happened? Watch on the right side of your screen. <laughs> Ross Chastain used the wall all the way around this racetrack to race his way into the championship four. He went from fifth to fifth place <laughs> that last lap. Okay, you got what happened, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the pilot could speed up uh, by grinding against the outer fence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after see, after <laughs> seeing this video, uh, we ask ChatGPT to answer this question. Of course, it doesn't work. Where is it? Yeah. Here? Yeah, let's click okay. Yeah. okay, so we asked, a Nesca racer won the race in the last lap by grinding against the outer fence of the racetrack. Why did this trick work? Okay, okay let's suppose that you are my physics student. Mm -hmm. In this question, there is no hint that I want you to answer in a physics way, but I'm pretty sure you understand that I want it. Why? Because... We are in a physics class. Mm -hmm. I'm your physics teacher. So for you, it's obvious. Mm -hmm. What about ChatGPT? It, 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 no. He has no idea about that, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, and actually, when we ask this question, it answers in a non physics way. It starts saying things about the Nesca race that I cannot evaluate because I have no clue of the story. And also, uh, saying that it's a very dangerous thing to do, both for the car and for the pilot. And it also showed a certain dose of skepticism by saying, well, maybe the person that told you this story did exaggerate it a little bit. Really? Yeah, this, so this kind of information. And it makes sense because uh, it has no idea that it has to answer in a physics way. So the first thing that we have to do in this case is to help it narrow down to the domain that we want uh, the answer be rooted on. And so what we did is adding this part of the, the to our problem, mm -hmm. explain it from the perspective of forces in circular motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, with this, we got uh, an answer which is more more uh, physics-y, <laughs> uh, not a perfect one, mm -hmm. but at least it was talking about acceleration and friction, so it was okay. Even better when we specified how to act. This is something valid not just for physics. Uh, so if you ask it to how we did, explain it like a physics teacher would from the perspective of forces in circular motion. Mm -hmm. So this apparently helped it really much more. And thanks to this, we got a 
perfect answer. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see all the conversation in the paper if you want to have some fun reading it. OK, so this is the first advice. Specifying the domain, specifying how to act when you ask a question. Something that you take for granted when you talk with someone. Second technique in context learning. So in context learning, take advantage of the capacity of the large language model to learn also from the prompt itself. So what we have to do is to provide it with input output pairs of uh, task and solution, task and solution, which uh, works as a demonstration context for the language model. And then write our task and leave it open for the chatbot. So in this way, we are providing both a pattern for the answer and the structure of the answer itself. So in the first case, it understands we are doing an addition, grammar correction, translation. OK, uh, this is a very simple technique and works for very simple tasks, of course not for physics problems that usually involve several steps, uh, especially related to reasoning, not just uh, this kind of input-output pair. And that's why chain of thought is very interesting uh, and also useful technique. So chain of thought is a family of fronting strategy aimed at improving the performance of the large language model in uh, complex reasoning tasks. And it can do it by engaging the large language model in a step-by-step -step reasoning. So basically with this technique, large language model like ChatGPT can solve a complex physics task by unpacking it in uh, more smaller and uh, simpler subtasks. And by spelling out the reasoning, by, by writing it down, like in the picture, uh, every step of this process is appended to the prompt. And then the uh, autocomplete instinct of the chatbot uh, uh, build a chain of argumentation, which has been demonstrated that is uh, way more likely to be logic and coherent, and so it works better. So uh, this is very useful for physics, uh, and I'm going to show you that it works very well. As I said, chain of thought is a family of prompting strategies. I'm going to show you a couple of them that we used in the paper. First one is called Q-Shot. Uh, basically, it's the evolution of in-context learning, uh, which incorporates a chain of thought reasoning in the demonstration context. So let's start with the left box. I put two examples. I just read one of them. So question. If a rectangle has a length of 6 cm and a width of 3 cm, what is the perimeter of the rectangle? Answer. The answer is 18 centimeter. But this is the input output pair, but not just like before, uh, very simple, but a little bit more elaborated. So my task is question. Sam has 12 marbles. He gives one fourth of them to his sister. How many marbles does Sam have left? Mm -hmm. And then ChatGPT answer. The answer is nine. Mm -hmm. Fine, he followed this pattern. But then with this technique, uh, so, uh, just to be precise, Q-shot means that I give several examples in the demonstration context. One shot is just one example. Sometimes one example is enough. So same question, but I incorporate the strategy that I want it to follow. So I add, for a rectangle, add up the length and width and double it. So the perimeter of the rectangle is 6 plus 3.2 equals to 18 centimeters. The answer is 18 centimeters. Mm -hmm. So when I go to ask my 
question, which is the same as before, it incorporates the chain of thought reasoning also in the answer. And it answered. It gives one fourth dot 12 equal to three marbles. So Sam is left with 12 minus three equal to nine marbles. The answer is nine. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so this is this first technique, which is very interesting. But I would say uh, not extremely useful for us in physics because you see how uh, the example that you choose for your demonstration content is important. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to find a task which is isomorphic to the task that you want the chatbot to answer. And this is not super easy, especially for a student at the beginning. And also I would say that if you're able to find an isomorphic problem, you are kind of alpha way to be able to solve it by yourself. Maybe. So uh, this is interesting, but maybe not the best. Way more interesting is zero shot. So in this case, uh, we don't have a demonstration content. Mm -hmm. We start with other, our task, which is uh, on the left side, which is a question. A juggler can juggle 16 balls. Half of the balls are golf balls, and half of the golf balls are blue. How many blue golf balls are there? And in this case, I want the strategy to be like this. The answer, Arabic numeral, is, and then the chat put answer, eight, which in this case is wrong. Mm -hmm. You see, it's a bit more complicated problem. On the other end, we have this other strategy, uh, which simply ask, let's think step by step. Mm -hmm. So it stimulates the large language model to engage in a step-by-step -step reasoning by simply asking it to do it. And what we get is, there are 16 balls in total. Half of the balls are golf balls. That means that there are eight golf balls. Half of the eight uh, the golf balls are blue. That means that there are four blue golf balls. And this is right. So what happened is that um, in this way, by asking, let's see, think step by step, you are asking to go to look at the in, in his training data set and find where there is our step-by-step -step reasoning. And it doesn't matter if the task is different because it look at the, that structure and it can reproduce it for this task, for a totally different task. Can I ask a question now? Yeah. At what point we're teaching students to think about what are the steps for the problem versus think about what are the right prompts to be used to produce the right answer. Uh, can you say it again? Sure. So let's say, let's say I'm a student yeah. and you're the teacher. And obviously one of the many learned outcomes is for me to look at a problem, interpret it, and so on and so forth, right? So you are telling me, but you're not telling me, but I am, you know, okay, I need to think about this problem step by step, Yeah. right? On the other hand, we can have the same situation. I'm a student, I just want to pass the course. So I need to learn how to use the right prompts. So do you think there's a huge danger that we're actually somehow teaching the students, hey, how do you use the right prompts so you can let ChatGPT give you the answer versus no, I need to think about the problem so I can solve it. And then, okay, maybe I can use ChatGPT to check the correctness of my answer. Okay, but this is, the question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sense is that uh, we have to find uh, some fruitful way to use ChatGPT. <laughs> yeah. And we can talk about that, that later because we can discuss like, precisely which kind of role ChatGPT can play. Yeah. Uh, there could be some, I mean, some, we got some ideas. Uh, we can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, yes, in the end. But this thing to me was like crazy. I mean, actually, I put this picture to give you know, <laughs> <laughs> It basically looked up and it can reproduce this structure. And so at the beginning, I mean, I, I knew about this uh, strategy around June, July, but we were already playing with ChatGPT and we already 
kind of get this feeling that we have to ask it to reason to write it down not correct to say but a little bit like we also do i mean sometimes you cannot just answer to a question you need to think about it it's not the same you know, you know but somehow it's right now so uh if we consider the example of before uh we try to apply this idea to this question so in our way we write provide your reasoning first and only then provide the answer mm -hmm. which is basically a way to ask to it reason step by step and then give me the answer so but just adding this part we got that seven times over eight it answered correctly and also that the explanation that it provides were more detailed and logically well structured so what we got is a higher rate of correctness and better output but just asking it to reason first and is that with the temperature turned up? What, sorry? Is that with the temp high temperature? The, that is GPT. And this is chat GPT. As I said. So this is, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, you you don't, you have no control over the temperature. Of temperature. Yeah, exactly. This is another question. Same, uh, same story of before. Uh, there is a question, multiple choice. We, we just put it. And what it did was, first of all, pick uh, an option, it was usually letter D, incorrect, and then providing a reasoning, and this reasoning was kind of a justification of the selected answer. And you could feel kind of a tension if you read the answer, because sometimes the physics was nice, it was going well, but then since it had to be coherent with the option that it picked, it started saying unlogical thing, not connected. But then we again ask, explain the reasoning first and only then provide the answer. And it got, uh, I don't remember how many times I tried, but a lot of time, correct. It's starting by reasoning and the reasoning ended up with the correct option. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would say that the presentation can be over in the sense that we can talk together about the implication for education. Um, or I just put some pictures which represent the scenarios that we identify. Maybe I can take... Brain exploding again? <laughs> no, no more brain that. I can take a couple of minutes to show you this picture and then we can talk about it. So, oh, first picture. <laughs> so this picture to me represents uh, students that use ChatGPT as a teacher. Uh, this is totally what we don't want, uh, especially now that we know better. Or I don't know if now you know better how GPT and ChatGPT work, but it's happening, right? I mean, we know that they are using it uh, and they are not aware of its way of functioning and they have not teacher or someone that guide them uh, in a right way to use it. So we can talk about this. This is not a scenario that we would like. Rather, we would like something more like this. Students that use ChatGPT as one of the other possible tools that they have um, for developing the skill that we think they need still to develop. Uh, and a bit to answer to your question, uh, one idea that we were thinking about is that uh, a teacher can ask students to use ChatGPT for answering the questions and then evaluate what ChatGPT says, yeah. which I would say is an even harder task because I think that you have to be, um, you have to know the topic yeah. to answer a question, but to correct a question is even harder. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, sometimes when I had to look at it answering the for the physics question, Sometimes I didn't notice details or, I don't know, it, it's not easy. No, you had did something similar in his course, right? Good. With uh, Virginia, you asked the students a question and then you asked it to run by GPT again and then they write their feedback about the question. Virginia did. Oh, it was Virginia, okay. We, we, we had another, yeah, it was the- Yeah, yeah, I heard that presentation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, 
this is something interesting. So I think the, the, I mean that part is why it's such a good tool for teacher education because if you, if you have teacher students that are in a way like experts in their subjects and then you give them this type of tasks, then they can actually assess some of the output from from the AI because they have learned the subjects yes. pretty well. I mean, as it's, they're considered experts if they're already like a couple of years in or something. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. You, you have to be a bit expert to do that. Mm. So it's not maybe the best thing to do for a student at the beginning. No, no, no. no. But also, we can think about that. But there was a... Oh, no, no, go ahead. It's a good example. You're not going to like it. Um, okay. <laughs> so... So in in in, the, in our discipline, which is like programming, um, Brett Specker, one of the famous researchers, he gave a keynote and he was like, 40, 50 years ago, there were people protesting about the use of calculators because, you know, it quickly gives them the answer. I remember that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, no, not <laughs> even his argument. You know, he was like, okay, so why why should we use, uh, waste our time using calculators when we can like write code? And yeah. For me, I can see the parallels. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the moment in which we should think which kind of skill still want the student to develop, mm -hmm. which other one can be left. Yeah. Uh, and which new ones do we need? Is prompt engineering something that will become a mm -hmm. thing? I don't know. <laughs> there is an interesting parallel to debate about school curriculum in Sweden as well, because I mean, there's been a discussion in the like, last couple of years mm -hmm. because of the Swedish curriculum right now is very much focused on like loose taxonomy like this type of oh God. way of doing it and i mean even at a like primary school it's still like this and you have two like uh, you know tasks where you're supposed to analyze things in like very early ages mm -hmm. even though it's very difficult to analyze something when you don't know the subject you're supposed yeah. to analyze something in and i mean the critique has been like you know against this saying that we should learn you know the the subject first and the facts and the information like the the basic things first and then you can add these types of tasks where you have yeah. an analysis but right now you have like loose taxonomy but you have it for each year so you have yeah. to go through all the you know levels for all the years mm. so th and that that's uh, i mean and i think it's possible it's just it's so much more difficult yeah and teachers don't get too much support for no figuring out no. how to do it no. effectively no yeah but here you would have i mean if you would do this for like with younger kids it will be even more difficult for teachers to adapt it into the uh, education. Yeah, I see. Um, and so I would say these two pictures are more from a student perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, this last picture, I wasn't sure uh, <laughs> to use it because uh, it could be misleading. So to me, this picture means uh, the one in the center is a teacher. And the idea is not to have, of course, a class full of ChatGPT or AI, but more if ChatGPT can somehow uh, be used as a model of student for teacher to train some skills or also to develop some activity to see, to do some in vitro uh, tests, you know, to use them. And uh, that's cool. That's an idea. And it, so we also submitted another paper recently, uh, which is a little bit more focused on this idea. Let's say if ChatGPT, ChatGPT's output can somehow resemble students' output. And spoiler, no. <laughs> but this is maybe this is uh, an, another kind of discussion. The previous one is more maybe urgent also. Uh, Yes, that's over. <laughs> um, I see that Cedric has a question okay. or raising his hand. So maybe you can just um, unmute oh. yourself, Cedric, and ask it. I'll be fun, Bo. What did you say? I can put it big screen. Okay. Uh, Julia. Yes. I'm very interested in the example that you used. We use the word trick. And I think this is the source of the problem because I looked up what the Oxford Dictionary says trick is. There was no trick there. The trick is when you deceive somebody 
that's one use of it, a cunning thing that you do to deceive somebody, like I trick you out of your money, or it's something that you do, it's a habit that you have. And the example that they give in the Oxford Dictionary is she had a trick of cutting off the end of her words. So in English, and since it's a language thing, trick does not mean applying physics. So isn't there a problem that if you use a word like trick, you guided it into giving a, a, an incorrect answer because it couldn't figure out. You've given it a word trick that's got nothing to do with physics. Well, the question. I just thought when I saw that, you're going to get it wrong yeah, yeah. Now because you used the tricks. What if you replace trick with physics? I think you would have got a different answer. I think it's trick that gave him the clue to look somewhere else for something that was deceptive. Yeah, yeah, it totally could be. I have other examples that show that uh, if you change a little bit this kind of words, uh, it gives. Like for example, a quest. I I ask a question, and I mean I I, I put a problem, and the question was like, what can you say about this thing? Or uh, in another side, determine the the thing. So what can you say was a format, and in the other question was determine, and determine seems to kind of direct it more to a physics idea. Is more scientific, more technical, determined instead of what can you say about. So, of course, the use of words uh, can uh, can make a lot of difference. But in this case, it's even stronger because this word in English is used in two completely different ways. One to use it as a habit and yeah. other to use it as deception. So you've given a word that is so without any clue which way you want to use it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I just, you know what I mean? So I, yeah, I'm you're right. And often, often languages have that, that they have two, two completely different mm -hmm. meanings, but they use the same word for two completely different things, especially yeah. English. Yeah, I mean, and, but the prompt also should represent the way in which, I mean, you approach the design of a prompt, isn't it? I mean, you go there and you just write the question without thinking a lot about uh which word is is it the right word is it the best word um yes isn't that what you're telling us that you've got to use what? the right isn't that what you're telling us you've got to use the right words I'll give you an example in south africa they call traffic lights robots but american would never understand a traffic light to be a robot i remember i was living in america and somebody asked me the direction i said go past three robots and turn right after the person drove off, they said, what's a robot? You know, robots, you know? Yeah. So it's the context of the use. So it's not only, when they look at the language, different cultures use also the same word for different meanings. So you also got that, that problem. Yes, yes. That's why prompt engineering is, I mean, so prompting is very well, hard. Think, that's why I think it's so interesting what you're doing. Yeah, but wow. Well, Yes. So I think you should use that as an example because it's not just, as you say, is there a difference between calculate and... Uh, okay. What can we say about... Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, or the other one, what was the other one with that you used to? Determine. determine. Is there a difference between determine and calculate? Yeah. Also. See what I mean? I mean. So some people say there is a difference. That's why they are... They are that's why there are those two words in English. They do have different meanings, and you can use them differently in different contexts, and so on. So, yes. Anyway, thanks for a very nice talk. I thought it was very interesting. I just was thinking of these examples of how... Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, what you brought up, Cedric, this, this is exactly what is what makes prompting so, so kind of... Tricky. Uh, tricky, yeah. <laughs> tricky, tricky <laughs> yes. There's another use of the word. <laughs> it's like small changes in the prompt can produce big differences in the output. Yes. But you can understand why, because when people say they don't understand why, because the language is used without context. That's, you know, without the social semiotics. Usually, if you think about social semiotics, language is used for particular social groups. So if you're working in physics, power has a particular meaning. But if, you, if you're working in another particular group, then it doesn't have, it has a different meaning. Political people, then they would use power to mean something different. Not. And if you're looking at 
gender and studies and so then power would even mean something completely different so you know the, the social group uses the word also in its own form but when you're using there it doesn't know what social group you're using it for right yeah totally yes you want yeah. one of the things that i i think that this like thank you for the talk thank you this is <laughs> I, I think like the stuff that you have in here is actually really relevant for students like now and I don't think that's really so often that we have this in education where it's like you 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 can go out to a class and tell people stuff that they maybe don't already know or stuff that would probably help them. Yeah. And I'm also curious to know what you already know about this. Because I say this is for the physics community, mm -hmm. physics education community. But I would I'm interested to understand how many differences yeah. there are in the knowledge that we have at this point about these things. Yeah, I mean I, I you, you went to the thing yesterday on Monday. And I think a lot of people are still in the kind of philosophizing mm. thing and they're, and they're not anywhere near as close to the so practical details of like, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. Yeah. If you have three prompts that lead up to something, then that's... Yeah, that's what we wanted to do. Yeah. Uh... And I, I think one of the biggest risks, and I think Natalie talks about this as well, is if students are using this and some students are, like you said, they already know how to structure the prompt or they're already halfway there to finding a good example. Those are the students that are already you know good yeah and you have students that struggle and if students that struggled i mean this isn't some magic thing that's going to make them all I'll of a struggle. sudden yeah yeah it'd be great if anything it's like the, yeah. the yeah the possibility yeah. to widen the gap which yeah. is like you know that's disparaging mm -hmm. that you know the the students that are already doing well this could just make them be better and the students that are not doing yeah. well this will just frustrate them and you know Go give them a that. worse experience so i think that this kind of uh, stuff you have is really relevant thank you nice. that, that, I, I think that's kind of what, what i mostly think about with this is how it plays out in the classroom i don't know <laughs> i just want to say a comment it's not a question your slide up to one of the first robots but uh, don't worry about it yeah if... i thought they were, it was such a beautiful explanation as to explain to the student what is the difference between chat gpt and uh gpt itself and why we are using it and i'm hoping like would you would you volunteer to be a speaker when the students come for orientation and then we explain to them this is what it is it has potential but also we haven't figured out yet how to use it so don't use it so would you be like can i remind, remind you so i can recommend you to other people in the department to give a present or which slide was that can you yeah, which one? So, I don't, I, wait, from the beginning up until uh, this one. Uh, maybe the limitations in child is good. Da, 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 da. So, I, I think this is important they I, learn. I don't think. Uh, the... So, this is. Yeah, no, no, this is important. That it does not copy. Yeah, it does not copy. I think it's important for them to know that. Next slide. So, yeah, maybe, yeah, and then maybe we stop it here. But I no, think... but I mean, you you absolutely should have the rest of the stuff. I mean, the point of the presentation is not that you shouldn't use it, right? No, exactly. So that's, what that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. Okay. Oh. Just be aware. Some people would believe that they cheat and won't use it at all, or even as a tool. Yeah. And some people would. Oh, what are the risk regulations? Because I can't even think. Yeah. yeah. These are another thing that we are waiting. For. Yeah. Well, there was one case that was go went to the disciplinary. I don't know, at, at least one, which was actually my student, who, who, uh -huh. and I and I did I, and I started this procedure just because I wanted to know to how how should we like I mean, how are, how do you perceive this basically yeah. to them? Is that the thesis one? Uh, no, it was for uh, inland inland institute. So it was graded assignment graded assignments, which the students submitted by just copying the question into ChatGPT. Who is changing all the time? Um, you can't. You can't prove it. Well, I, I, I knew. <laughs> yeah, I saw, right, I knew because I asked those exactly same questions in a research project, ChatGPT, and it gave me almost identical answers. Okay. The sen oh. sentence structure was very similar. It was similarly nonsensical, mm -hmm. so the the answers were incorrect. So it wasn't like. So what? So I asked the, the student. Uh, I said, like, did you use ChatGPT? He said yes. So that's all I know. Student then. He got a uh, warning that he, he that he shouldn't do it. Okay. 
Yeah, because Edna. And then after three written war <laughs> warnings, and then, and then you have a misdemeanor, and then after seven misdemeanors. I don't know. So <laughs> basically, I didn't do it to punish the student. Sydney, but mm -hmm. yes, the student had to stay back in school for an hour with the teacher. Right. Uh, no, with the teacher. Uh, I didn't mind that that they would use it. What I minded was that they did they they provided bad answers, and I was. At first, I was really struggling to understand how someone could write these answers because they were so uncannily weird. Yeah. They were yeah. wrong, but in ways that I have yeah, never I, experienced. I, I think students bank on that the teachers don't read the right read the things. Right. And I was like, did they submit some? My feeling was this student is so terribly confused. They write really well, but this is I can't even know where I should start because this student seems to be so confident in what they know, but they yeah. are so wrong. <laughs> And they are wrong in ways which I've never seen before. Like they, they can, they understand the first part, but then in the second part, they contradict themselves uh -huh. completely. So I was like, "This is weird." And then I was like, "Oh, wait a second. I already, yeah. I already saw this somewhere. I wrote a paper on it, <laughs> and, and then I copied the questions, and I saw, oh my god, this is, this is it. Like this is." And, and I mean, it detectors, the detectors don't work. But no, of the more, the more you read the answer of ChatGPT, the more you kind of. Develop a right. name. You saw that. Yes, you, you recognize. Yeah. We saw that in the activities we did with teacher students. We exactly. gave them um, a question, and then they had to solve it, and then they got question or answers to the question, which were, some of them were ChatGPT generated, and some were student generated, like real high school students, and they could identify like 70, not, uh, 70 80, 90 percent of ChatGPT answers, uh, which is better than GPT zero, <laughs> right? right? So it's. I think there's. We have a sense uh if you if you use it a lot you you start to get the sort of the nag oh something's fishy here at least for now right you don't know about chat g to be seven of course, of course. <laughs> so, so i had, I had a comment yeah. also that but these were very pr primitive uses very interesting Thank and you. i i have seen a paper or i've heard someone and look at my colleagues who talked about research on prompting have you heard it who was this not me. Everybody last week. Yeah. yeah, I mean, someone has written a paper in computer science on on how to teach students to prompt. Probably Brett or Keith Ita. I'm, I'm not sure. No, okay, I couldn't find it. Okay. it there's a lot of paper in computer science, of course, also, mm -hmm. on, 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 the, on this. Yes, it's... It's crazy. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, like, it's very crazy. And even if we say this now, we don't know how it is in a year. And not even in a month. I mean, I was... No, right. Right now, you read, you try to read literature, and there's like journals are useless. You're just on archive. Like stuff is coming out so fast. Like before it gets published in a journal, it's outdated mostly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like I mean Wikipedia, maybe that's it's faster cool. to to try to publish results to to write than the thing. Yeah, I make a section prompt engineering. Hey, we're in the physics department, or so so I I so I Google Google on Scholar Google on on this prompting now. And what the loss of and everything was from 2022 or 2023 yeah. and the 2022 you know i mean you you can have a look at okay. uh, the paper if you want but if you look yeah i've printed some we have 99 references and i would say that almost all of them are from 2023 yes yeah and you you read every paper about chat gpt didn't you <laughs> no <laughs> There was a period in yeah, every there, day that yeah, we knew. Many things that need to be researched here, of course. Mm -hmm. Among what you said, there are very interesting research questions. The, yeah. The, if, if, if you want to research specifically this. Well, one of the things we had was, you know, we had a conference in Finland in the summer, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's 30 more papers of chat. Yeah. yeah. Published and boom. Uh, yeah. I think it's every, every time there's a conference now, it comes a wave. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I wonder how many of these papers address the same kind of things. Uh, I mean, not in this way. I haven't found uh, in the way we did. Um, so I would say half of the paper are about uh, how can we integrate it? So can we use it uh, for developing uh, programs and for help students with disabilities or I mean a lot of way how to use it but not a systematic look at how it works and that half of the paper are, are more technical let's say about prompting from prompt techniques 
or never applied to physics. Um, not a practical instruction, let's say, if I answered your question. And I, I, I feel what's coming is, you know, these taxonomies of uh, GPT mm -hmm. papers and you say, oh, okay, we did the literature review and it's, you know, 50 papers, we're looking at how to integrate 30 papers, right. we're looking at cheating and it's happening already. Yeah. <laughs> there's a yeah. there's a problem with the community how to communicate this with the students because you have right. so students yeah. if you talk about this in like you shouldn't use uh you know AI or GPTs the the problem is that I mean students that that cheat they will use it and then students that are like you know scared of cheating they yeah. won't use it at all yeah. and then you have like a, a a gap where you have a lot of students that are cheating so you will kind of uh, you know, make the claim of you know, using it for cheating too by saying that yeah. this, you know, it's a by saying that you should avoid this in education. So I asked uh, at two last week when I had a similar presentation, although not as not as fine as this one, I must say. Uh, but um, they were asking, you know, like some some, you know, when you apply for excellent ladder, yeah, uh, you write your portfolio, yeah. like your reflection. And someone wrote it and wrote in the end that parts of this were written by ChatGPT. Mm. And my my reaction was, of course, yeah. it's the exact kind of, I don't want to say bullshit task, but I kind of mean it, it is a bullshit task. Like you need to write something that sounds fancy yeah. to impress people yes. about like how good you are. Mm. And I mean, ChatGPT is like, it's the perfect tool for this. Yes, so is. I'm surprised, like I'm not at all surprised that people do it. And then I asked the two people, uh, the person who told this to me, did you think less of this person because of it? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think there is something there. Right? If you admit that you use it, people will say, bullshit, mm -hmm. this is not good. Like You shouldn't use it. Oh, we don't like this. If you don't admit that you use it, people will say, oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I know so, so, it's the right, it's, it's the right incentives, right? So remember send out an email that the IEEE, you know, the engineering, uh, mm -hmm. they they have come out with some recommendations. Recommendations. And what was it again? If you use it, say. Mm. If so you we, use it, you have to say. Yeah. So that we can. So it's a, it's a re recommendation to have it as an acknowledgement. Mm. Yeah. So that, that's what science and nature also has now. Yeah, I think. So you, you, because both, so some researchers started using it as a co-author. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they were like saying that you should use it uh, in the acknowledgement you write that you have used it in that case. Are you agree completely? You can, in some way, also for proposals. Why not? You yeah, start with something from that you did, and then you just edit it so you get it. Right. Mm -hmm. My son used it to write 50 applications for summer job. Yeah, mm -hmm. I use Grammarly so for the yeah, writing to uh, edit them because. How about you get the job? Yeah, he, he got the job. <laughs> <laughs> Very big. Chat GTB said that I'm a marvelous student who loves right, right, right. words. There's a week and four hours in your beautiful I think they I think they trained it. I read about it. They trained a lot on a lot on like corporate jargon and like corporate yeah. sort of like uh, like business uh, My, Microsoft like, was just like here you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hi, so Anne's sitting here with me. That was make such an interesting comment to you. I want to just tell you two things. One, use Grammarly, right? But yes. nobody said you have to admit that you used it, right? But I'm telling you, it's using the same thing. Because what I did is I tried taking, I tried using AI. There's a thing called Trivoli. And I took Grammarly and I gave the same document to both of them. And they came up with almost the identical things. So I've concluded and all that Grammarly is doing is using AI because how did this happen? So I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but it, that, it's interesting that you raise that. So use Grammarly, nobody feels guilty. Why would you feel guilty then using AI? It's just, it's a passing phase, I think. Yeah, it's exactly. It's something which somebody's imposed on us that we must feel guilty. Although, about. I mean, Grammarly doesn't write the paper for you in ChatGPT can. Technically, can write the paper for you. I mean, yeah, like that's family, what. Oh no, no, no! If you take premium, they change all. It does. It changes whole sentences, even paragraphs. It comes up with suggestions of new. Right, ones. right. 
If you have the free Grammarly, it won't do that. But if you pay right. them for the premium one, it does. I mean, it offers you the possibility, right? You know, isn't, isn't ChatGP also offering the possibility? I mean, ChatGP, you need to tell it exactly what you want from it. But the Grammarly like offers the what it can do for you in a sense, mm -hmm. right? But there are GPTs that are like you know based on on ChatGPT that use there is like there's one called uh like book GPT or something that writes like a bullshit book for you. So you just give the flavor text <laughs> like I want a book about uh, like a story storytelling book or something. Well, have you have you seen the thing that uh, yeah. yeah. You now on the phone you can talk with it. It has the voice integration now. Which one? G Chat GPT the chat on the phone. Have you have you played with that yet? No. That's fun. That's nuts. <laughs> okay. So you, you, you voice recognition, it. voice to text, and then text to voice. Right? Yeah, yeah. We, we we can play with it after if you want. Yeah, but so, I mean, I showed you this. Maybe bit. they don't have it in Sweden yet. No, but or, or it's it's probably part of ChatGPT four. So you will have to. No, it's not. It's the free one, but my Apple account oh, okay. is from the US. Okay. Oh um, uh, yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, the there's like new 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 like uh, abilities coming in right like now it can also interpret exactly which is a big deal in a sense but especially in physics like we use all sorts yeah. of diagrams and graphs and all sorts of stuff drawing sketches and if, if it can help us with that it, that would be interesting and Although, it can generate a simulation i mean you, you can could basically do that you can do a lot of stuff but we the second paper that you sent in last week was basically checking out how well it can interpret graphs yeah and yeah yeah and uh, uh well yes the result is that he's not very good yet yet right. but uh it's weird in, it's weird and weird it's not good in weird ways and yeah, but I, I think you know as you start to learn like really what you said what do what do you need to prompt or what does it need to have for context or you know, maybe there's some way to interpret graphs that we don't know yet. Right. You know, like it is possible. I mean, yeah. You can describe a graph in so many ways, and so it it interprets them uh, with tokens. It translates, you know, it translates all the words in tokens. But maybe the translation with the graph with the image is different. Mm. Yeah, because where are the tokens in the image? Oh, yes, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, some, some it does have a certain way of sequencing the image to, yeah. to generate tokens. And then there's also the language. This architecture is the same, but it just works with pixels basically, yeah. instead yeah. of words. But uh, it, and it, yeah. but the, the, the problem is it can reason about the concepts in the graphs. If you describe the graph in words, it can solve the task. But if you give it the graph, it sees it in the wrong way. Like it says, oh, I can see the line is parabolic and it's like blah, blah, but it's like, no, it's like literally a straight line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes maybe it's just happen. Maybe it's just a being that's seeing things in a higher dimension than us and yeah, it actually is hyperbolic. <laughs> What's your belief in reality? Yeah, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. I feel like the the we found this uh, guy who writes so he he makes his own like APIs that connect to ChatGPT and he had uh, uh he wrote some code in Python which takes screenshots like I think it's like once every fifteen seconds or something and then uploads it to ChatGPT and then as it as, as images ask it to describe it but with the voice of David Attenborough <laughs> and then yeah so he can just like sit and watch videos. Or uh, have images being put up, or write like something in a word, or something. Sure. That it will be narrated by David Attenborough. Like it will be like a you know David. But it's not the voice. What? It's not the voice. It's his voice. It's his voice. Yeah, yeah, they did the fake like, voice. Yeah. So you can do this like yeah, where you have. So I mean, he's he's basically just sitting at the beginning. I think he's sitting writing Python, yeah. and he and it narrates as like a nature movie yeah. by David Attenborough about about his. <laughs> right in, in, in Python. In this scene, we can see, yes, yes. No, exactly. we can see uh, some complicated <laughs> loops. <going>. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now all of the, what's it called when books pass the, pass the day, can they publicly available? Like the classical books? Oh yeah, yeah the, when you lose the, it's, it's a public domain. Yeah, the yeah. public domain. Yeah. So now, um, Audible and all of these companies are scrambling because Mm. I can upload a book to ChatGPT, ask it to be narrated by someone, mm. and that takes away from their business model. Mm. Competition. Yeah. Capitalism. Mm -hmm. Oh, the thing that you built sucks now? Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> I mean, it's 
I mean, I think just economically, you know, like there's so many companies that have you know, spent so much time and effort and money and research in investing, in, like making some tool. And then this is just like, oh, this is just a general purpose, everything. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there was a strike of actors just this year. Yeah, was a, a, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of it was about like, I don't allow, I will not allow my my sort of voice or my face, yeah. my face to be used for end, to generate the end, endless copies of myself to be you know to be your audiobook reader yeah. yeah for any book you want because that's my voice right and i guess i mean makes sense so, so this, what? using a synthetic voice would would be i mean like a voice that doesn't actually exist would solve this problem right mm -hmm. and it's not impossible to do it's just but something for you to consider you can take it a little bit further because like a lot of the students these days are um conscientious about the world and what's happening to them and some of them like uh, one of them recommended to me to watch like this documentary about ChatGPT and uh, uh, all of these systems, right? And if you look at it, yes, there is quote unquote machine that does these things, but behind it, there are like human beings who have been exploited. Mm -hmm. So there are people in America in prisons who are like, uh, as part of their work during prison, so they can get like food, is like training the data or tagging the data. So, you know. Is that true? <laughs> no, they don't starve you if you don't do stuff. They're... You don't starve you, but like it, this is exploitation, right? It's America. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not any other country. Really... And if you take it even further, like, uh, you know, they're using uh, children in Africa to mine for uh, metals that are used, like, um, in processing. Yeah. It depends on how far you, you want to go back. Yeah, yeah. The argument. So, um, are you okay with benefiting of using a technology mm -hmm. that's actually built on the suffering of other human beings? That's why I think that ethics is so important, mm. especially for computer scientists, mm. because they rule the world. Mm. Uh, <laughs> science rule the world. Money, that's <laughs> I was, I was really hoping that the uh, all of these heads of the tech companies would would have overthrown the at least the American government by now, but. <laughs> mm. They would oh. Well, there are, you know, some tech people who you think they should not be the leader of the United States. And there are, and there are some leaders of the United States that I think shouldn't have. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, great. They're going to find me now. This is not China. <laughs> I, got a, um, I got a review back from a paper. And I don't know if I, if I don't know, did I tell you this yet, Emma? No. <laughs> One of the reviews that I got back, I applied for a, a conference, and the review like rephrased the title of my submission, mm -hmm. and I was like, "Huh?" Oh yeah. And then I looked at it, and I was like, "Oh wait a second, I think I've seen this before." And uh, I think the reviewer was using ChatGPT to just copy and paste the paper, and then making the summary, and then like make make it better, like this. No, no, like they did the review with ChatGPT. Like, okay. Yeah. Oh my God, the summary. You can easily go review in chat GPT. This is a problem that we have at 60 TS. And that and that sucks because that, that was also the best of the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really like that yeah. solves the problem when the conferences allow 23 pages or whatever, you know. Here are eight pages that do on all each of them are 25, and you should review them in a week or two. Well, I mean, um, he brought it up to me, and then I asked this question on behalf of mm -hmm. without telling you and there are like a lot of discussions about what is it is it's okay it's or not it's 60 yeah yeah because like uh, you know he's about oh, yeah, 60. i mean like that's especially that's when you're supposed, supposed to get feedback on your things like right. in a way, yeah. i can i can send my own work to chat gpt and right, see what yeah. chat gpt says but if, if yeah. that kind of starts and to water down the academic process no i, I that, was, that, that sucks that was kind of what i was thinking when i got like student responses in the course, I'm like, I'm giving you feedback. I'm spending my time, yeah, like trying to help you, but I'm actually talking to a chatbot. Yeah, yeah. And you're just the intermediary between me and the chatbot. That's what was most upsetting. That's what I didn't want to happen in the future. That's why I escalated it. If it was just a student who, you know, whatever, right? I mean, that I, I'm not concerned about it. Like, I understand why he did it and all that. That's it. But on a lar larger scale, I see this could be a problem. If you all of a sudden teachers are forced to read these extremely complicatedly wrong answers, which are very taxing on your brain because they're so well written and you need to really unpack like the 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 substance of what they're saying, and then this substance is messed up, and you're like, 
oh, my brain hurts only thinking about it. But then imagine you have to review uh, like 30 answers like this. I actually 30. Did. <laughs> we did actually. I mean, <laughs> for, for this paper, I, I had for the to, second one, it was 700. 780. But uh, I don't want to do it if I can avoid it. <laughs> so, red eyes. And yeah. No, it's like <laughs> brain bleeding almost. It's crazy. Uh, I was feeling bad after the first 25. I said, okay, I stopped here today. <laughs> and then it. you start giving those to chat GPT to tell you <laughs> that. <laughs> AI assessing AI yeah, assessing AI. Possibility. We still feel that, you know, like, I don't trust the, the thing that's answering to reassess itself and it'd be good. <laughs> and that the point is that in the end, we take the responsibility for the final product, right? But if you prompt for the correct product, <laughs> <laughs> give me a unique answer. I mean, there's a, there's a project that they want to do now. Uh, I'm having a meeting tomorrow. Let's we'll see what it, if it becomes anything. Uh, a researcher from Switzerland wants to involve Uppsala in a project where they would give student responses to questions uh, to to get feedback from ChatGPT to help them improve their homework sort of assignments. And then analyze it. And... Yeah. And 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 then they would they would ask students how helpful these. So this feedback was to me that's not sufficient to decide if it's good or not because you might think it's helpful but it's mm. bullshit right so yeah I mean it, 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 the language is as you say it can sound very sophisticated so yeah right and you're and you're and you're, that this is good. Yeah. Yeah. and you're good at physics so imagine someone who's not good at physics <laughs> well, I agree you should ask them to change you know to add something to that mm. this other product you know sure, yeah I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna question the shit out of it tomorrow but. <laughs> For sure, I'm going to be very uh, clear about like the things that I think could be problematic. But you know, well, it would be interesting is, just yeah. to see if this kind of feedback can be used with with success. Mm -hmm. Because you know, often teachers give shit feedback too. Mm -hmm. and, they have to give maybe to tons of feedback, and they start writing. Okay, but I mean <laughs> that question: What do students think about the feedback? It's Pretty shallow. Yes, exactly. That's I what mean, I, mean. I think you you really go, would need to go into the data and mm. analyze this, and and that would be interesting to see because then you can see what do students understand of the feedback and think of the quality. So mm -hmm. you think this is a brilliant feedback, and you mm. can uh, analyze it. Yeah. Maybe find something. And else. I can see this is not good back good feedback at all. It's just friendly feedback. Uh, yeah. Friendly yeah. feedback. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I I think would be really like just kind of hypothesizing ideas. But, you know, where the students, when they go into the exam hall and then they have, you know, these exams, like using chat GPT to not only like make an exam, but like, you know, say you make one of these custom models and it knows that it's going to actually administer an exam to the student and the exam is done in kind of natural, natural text. And the student yeah. goes in and then in the end, then you have this kind of chat history, which is the exam mm -hmm. where, and, you know, where you've really trained it like a specific model for a specific oh, exam. Like an oral exam. Mm -hmm. But yeah, done, yeah. done, outsourced oral exam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then yeah. you still read it. Well, you don't have time to read it. So you ask to read to summarize it. No, but I mean, like if you're in the exam hall and you go in and you're at the computer and it's just okay, you know, you're gonna you're gonna reason about physics for two, two, three hours, and then at the end we're gonna see what your if it's pass fail or what the grade is, and then if you have any things, you go back. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I think would be I, I think in generating exams or if you'd be able to have something where you could use it to assess students or administer. Things. Well, I think the reliability could be a big issue here right? because mm -hmm. if, if you can rely on it to do a good assessment in 90% of cases, like what about 10%? Yeah. It's like, can you fail a student just because your AI was not working well? Mm -hmm. um, and how much of, how, how unfair is that to students? Mm -hmm. But you first have, should find a way to compare it. Uh, so, I mean, what the teacher does right. could be unfair right. so it's like it's like medical research it becomes so, like you know what if we do nothing is it better than taking you know, MRI? MRI? no but it, actually that's often done like so they say like i think they did this for like is it better to take um sort of like mri imaging for any like mm -hmm. trouble and trouble that someone has just preventatively like just do it you know it doesn't harm you um it's not it's a non-invasive process just do it they found that actually no it's 
causing people more stress than it's mm-hmm. worth because people find all sorts of weird things on yeah. MRI, mm-hmm. which are not dangerous, but yeah. the doctor starts then saying, okay, but we should check this. And they maybe have a surgery to check the, the biopsy. It gets infected. It's, and it actually causes more trouble than just doing nothing and saying, when you have an issue, come back. So it's like, you know, these managerial uh, uh, examinations where you just check everything in the body. And then you find, oh, you have a weird thing on your bone there. Like, uh, you might have had that for like 10 years and no one knew. And so the, the thing is, doing something is not often, it's not always better than doing nothing. And I'm thinking here, like, I think this will sort of enter this interesting phase where we'll start looking at, oh, but well, maybe we think that teachers do a better job. But when we pit them against AI, we might see that on average, they do a worse job. Exactly. And and then like, what is the right choice then? Like, do we do we take away agency from all teachers? Or do we just let those teachers who don't want to deal with this use AI instead? So many questions with, with, when you're dealing with teaching, because you, you can say that ChatGPT gave a more uh, sophisticated and better answer. But on the other hand, the teacher might be very, you know, concerning and close and see the students in right. the eye. And the only person in that child's life who actually see, haven't you had breakfast today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there are so many other things in education that you, you cannot only say, oh, this is 95%. Whatever and I, I think, but I think the sword has two two sides, right? Because even on the other side, even if this tool is maybe bad for learning physics, if it if students are using it and if it's driving up their engagement or if it's you know it's if it's helping them get started on an assignment, which then they you know like if it's maybe not scaffolding, but you know it, it, even if it's bad, it could also have some good good effects. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's so hard I to think, see where I the... think here physics is actually pretty lucky because it's experimental science, right? So. You, you you can have the wildest ideas generated by AI, but at the end, someone will have to test, right? Does this actually work? Work, And like, does this theory pan out in reality? Is it actually like this? Is this the good, a good explanation? And AI doesn't, at least for now, doesn't have the capacity to do that. So in mathematics, it might be different. Or I don't know, in... Psycho- psychoanalysis, you know, theoretical psychoanalysis, it might be a very open field with, mm-hmm. where there aren't any clear answers in the end. But in physics, at least, we can definitely say this sounds good, but the measurement doesn't say the same. It's, it's valid. Right? Um, well, I used to su- suggest this research proposal that we travel into a black hole and we actually look what it looks mm-hmm. like. And- okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think that chat did to be able to suggest that. But it is a suggestion. You could say, well, it could be dangerous. <laughs> well, uh, it's getting close to a quarter two, yeah. and uh, it's been quite nice to sit there and listen, even though I'm a bit coughing a bit. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry but, to hear uh, you. Oh, well, it's, well, could have more fun, I guess. But uh, anyway, good presentation and good discussions. Um, and uh, yeah, so and next week we're going to have Urban. Is it next week? Yeah, next week. Yeah. So continue to interact with you guys at Pair. Yeah. Ooh, good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And bye. Thanks. Bye.